All right, everybody, we are back. This is episode 54 of An Untold Narrative. An Untold Narrative is a podcast where we feature and host uh, creatives of multiple different backgrounds who are on the ground floor working, trying to make a name for themselves and really building uh, from the ground up. And we try to share a spotlight towards them. And today's guest is no different. Um, she is a rock star uh, muralist. First, that's how I've kind of discovered her work. Um, Allie Grimm, but goes by the alias A.L. Grime. Um, Allie, what's up? What's up? How are you? I'm super well. How are you? Where are you? Uh, and then how are you doing? Uh, I'm great. Uh, I'm in Denver, Colorado. It's cool. cold outside though, so I'm it's hiding inside. <laughs> I also can appreciate uh, guests who like put up their own art like in the background. So for all our guests watching on YouTube, uh, you get an advantage and the people listening on Spod uh, Spotify or um, Apple, you got to check out the YouTube later. But um, thanks for plugging in your own work because it is cool. Um, yes. The first question I got is like, are you always from Denver? Um, where were you raised? Kind of how did you end up there? Um, so I was born in Venezuela. Oh, um, I didn't and, know that. Yeah, um, on an island off the coast um, called Margarita. Um, and we came to the U.S. when I was little, um, like four or five, um, and we actually moved to Colorado Springs, and then um, my mom just didn't feel like it was the right place to raise us. She wanted us to kind of be raised with a lot of culture and being able to experience more, and so um, we moved to D.C. when I was like six or seven, um, probably like six. Um, and so I grew up in Washington, D.C., uh, and I moved out here four years ago. Oh, okay. So you, you just went back to the start. Do you remember, like, your early early years in Colorado or no? I have, like, select memories. I remember, like, <laughs> learning how to ride a bike in Colorado. Um, I do remember, like, going into the mountains a lot. My parents took us, um, my brother and I, to Red Rocks all the time to, like, go see Ziggy Marley and stuff like like reggae shows and jazz shows so I have like select memories of that but I was so little that and we only lived here for such a like short period of time that I didn't remember too much um but when I did my my younger brother moved here first to go to culinary school and then when I moved out here my my parents were like why are you going there Colorado's so boring like stay over here um, but it is so much different than when we were here, like in the early nineties, you know, it's, it's growing, let's say. <laughs> well, I mean, you've, you've, uh, captured four years there already. So it sounds like you're not going anywhere, uh, anytime no. soon. No, I love it here. The proximity to the mountains is unbeatable. Yeah. And there is a growing art culture in Denver as well from mm -hmm. what I understand. Yeah, Definitely um growing expanding it was totally established like by the time I got here I moved here specifically like because the art scene was kind of it was established um and there were like there was a big festival here for murals and um within the like more psychedelic art that I made before so kind of make this is kind of the central hub for that style of art so I moved here for all of that but even in the last four years, it's grown so much and I'm more and more excited each year to see how the Denver art community expands even further. Yeah, that's good. I, I bet it's fun to like be part of that or like even as like an outsider who's coming in, but like it seems like your, your style of art fits in really well uh, within mm -hmm. the culture. Yeah, it was definitely not for the um, DC crowd. <laughs> um, they're a little more conservative on the art side. <laughs> so um, it does, my art does much better here. Let's That's just awesome. say that. That's awesome. <laughs> um, what was it? I was, I just had a thought in my brain. Um, what do you, if you, if you, if somebody asks you like, what do you do? Do you, con do you just say like, you're just like a flat out artist or do you consider yourself a muralist first? Or like, how do you classify yourself? Um, I tell people that I'm an uh, artist, muralist, designer, um, kind right. of the three things together. Um, but that, you know, last year, my bread and butter was murals. I 
would like to continue pushing that and then lean more into design. I enjoy painting and paintings are amazing, but actually I lied to you. I, I do not like painting paintings. It's like, it's like actual torture for me, but I like the product of it. But the process of painting a painting to me is like torture. And so. <laughs> I, everybody should go watch YouTube because my face is just in awe. I'm like, she's super talented at painting and yet she hates it. <laughs> I, I like, I'm arguing with myself the whole time. I really love drawing. I love illustration. I got started with ink and um, the ink process to me, I've never like really pushed doing it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Cause it's like, that's like my sacred space. That's what I love the most. Um, and so I kind of keep it to myself. Um, but I love painting murals and so I want to just like keep pushing larger and larger scale because um, it's just more fun for me painting just like I feel hold up a little bit when I'm doing it um, whereas like murals is a full body sport you're like dancing with your art and so I think I fell really in love with that dance and now I'm like bitter towards my paintings because I'm like I have to stand right here <laughs> <laughs> It is less interactive, right? Like you're, you're stuck on it, whether it's a 16 by 20 or 24 by 36. And like, that is, that is it. And there's only so much mobility around it. Um, mm -hmm. To that extent, I think you're right. Uh, and that's a fun way of, of saying that, that it's a dance uh, when you work within murals. Um, I am very curious. And this is a, this is a premeditated question. Although I offline, I told you that I had no premeditated questions. Um, <laughs> how did you get to your style of art? Because I personally, before I stumbled into your work or before we met on a clubhouse, I've never seen a style of art like yours. Like it's very linear, it's black and white primarily with small hints of color, um, but there, it's a style, right? Like it's, and it's very specific. And so like, how do you, was it the ink drawing process that like created that? Or like talk about like the infancy of you building up like the A.L. Grime world. Totally. So um, it started with ink, um, which is why I still keep a lot of things black and white. In, the, in 2020, I played a little bit with color. Um, being super candid, I think I was just really sad. And like we all were and um, or in 2021. And adding color to my work kind of let me play with something and I don't know it was exciting in a way that brought me a little bit of joy but now that I did it for a year and I look back at it it doesn't quite feel authentic to me it felt like I was forcing myself to do something because I was sad um so I think I'll lean back into black and white more um because it, it did start with black ink I was like moved out here and was living off tiny bit of savings so I was really broke and I didn't have any money for art supplies but I could afford India ink which is like those like jars of ink are like a dollar fifty they last months at a time is uh is is that the ink that they do I, I don't know what it's called like on the skin with like a the poker or whatever um no it's like um what goes in fountain pens oh okay yeah so it's that but I would just use a brush with it um and then like micron pens but that was like all I could afford was like paper and some ink. And so I started um, doing these halftone portraits where I would literally like, I had a light board and I would put a photograph down and then I would just trace the contour of the face with a compass, just spinning a compass back and forth. So that's how like the halftone circle portraits came to be was like literally with a compass and me drawing it back and forth. And then um, I would just free flow all the patterns around it. And I was going through a lot. My dad was battling cancer and then he passed away. And so for a long time, my art was just like processing what I was going through with patterns because they were repetitive and I could like get lost inside of them. And then that really started to speak to me. So I kind of just like leaned into it super hard and started with black and white murals. Um, I went to California with my friend Anna Charney to, we both got invited to paint for lightning in a bottle. Um, but then she was painting the container yard afterwards. So I went and I kind of like helped her, brought her snacks and stuff. And she like showed me how to scale things up 
how to prepare things for murals. And so once I saw that, I was like, oh, like, you know, I can add so much more detail if things are bigger. So I started leaning into that. That then brought me back to paintings. And now I'm just wrapped up in a black and white world. <laughs> okay, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, I do want to go back to why you moved to Denver, especially on very little savings. And like, you're just like, fuck it, I'm going to take a shot. Were you a full-time artist when you took that move or were you no. doing other things? I was a bartender. Okay. So you had a, a part-time, full-time gig, not necessarily in what you wanted to do, but just to pay bills and stuff like that. Yep. And I moved out here. I was a bar manager at a vegan restaurant for a while. Um, that was cool. But I think I was like, so emotionally checked out because of what was going on in my personal life. And then on top of that, um, I just had this like hunger to just get out there and go do it. And I will say that they were super patient with me. They gave me all the time off I needed when I needed to go do jobs. Um, and at the time as well, I was coordinating art for a lot of music festivals. Um, I used to work for a big electronic musician and did all of his art for all of his shows and then um, did it for a couple of like electronic festivals as well. We have and a little that, people in here. A people? Oh, yeah. Um, did you know that he like did that? Painting. Did you yeah, know that um, he did that? <laughs> see like in major like for major acts like when um unpopular opinion when they have lazy vjs they just use beeple packs and <laughs> because i know what they look like sometimes i'll be in the crowd be like mm -mm, this is all just beeple <laughs> that's hilarious also how come you didn't name drop uh who you worked with uh he's been canceled Oh, okay. That's fair. Okay, let's leave that yeah. out. I might edit this out. <laughs> yeah. Let's keep That's it okay. moving. <laughs> um, I grateful for the people I met through that experience. I think it was really beautiful and the community that was there was really wonderful and that's how I got started. So I uh, don't regret it, um, but I leave him in the past. I, I don't it. associate myself with it anymore. Um, but I, but I do still hold tight all of the friends I made, the connections I made, and a lot of those people still buy my work, support my work. So I'm forever grateful for that experience. So how long have you been kind of doing art full time or are you still not doing art full time? I am now doing oh, art okay. full time. Um, so I quit, I went, 2018 I went to Art Basel, painted my first mural, 2018, yeah. Um, and then um, came home and kind of just left slash was so mentally checked out that it was like a like a we don't think you want to work here and I was like I don't that's actually true um, and so I stopped working I did like still pick up a couple curation jobs here and there to pay the bills um, but then I had some savings also um, again and I'm just, I like, I'm good at living like a really poor person. And so, you know, I made it work until now. I'm, I still live like humbly, but um, yeah, just the stretch savings. So I, I, I want to poke at this a little bit. One, because I'm, as, a, as an artist myself, I definitely do art part-time, right? But there's so many artists and creatives who want to do it full time, but the challenge is making sure you can keep the lights on. Right. And mm -hmm. so do you have to have a specific mindset of like living a minimalist life of like, Hey, I don't need all these things. Like my, to my core, it's like, I'm okay with a couch, a TV, and then my art, like, or is there, are there ways to project your work and then get like decent funds or, you know, are you charging a certain amount that like can help people uh, to set you up for success to build the savings or like, how do you kind of manage all of that? Because it seems like there's so many, or formerly there was a lot of starting starving artists and it was very challenging to do it full time. Mm -hmm. I think um, people need to be super honest with themselves. Like first thing I did was really 
um, calculate how much money I needed to survive a month, you know, paying all my bills, realistically, how much food do I eat? What do I need? What do I not need? And I cut everything out. Like, I was like, I don't really need to smoke weed. So I'm not going to buy it for a while. I don't really need to do this or that. And so um, I just cut all of it out. And I wouldn't even go anywhere. If is it going to benefit me? Nope, then I'm going to start working. So I had to be super honest with myself and be like, can I live like this? Do I just have enough money to pay my bills? And then I would calculate like, okay, how many things do I need to sell to hit this number? How much can I afford to dip into my savings every month? And so I gave myself like a six month trajectory and split my savings into those six months. And then I was like, okay, I have to split the difference each month on these to hit that number. Um, and then I took a few curation jobs that helped me like not bump into those savings too much. Um, and I just did a lot of like networking. I think that's super important going to like any free gallery show I could get, go to go to like any event to support other artists that I could just go and talk to them and ask them for advice and just like get connected here and there. Um, and for a, a bit, I, you know, probably like the first year, like 2019, I still kind of worked 2020 still kind of was like barely scraping by on savings. Um, but eventually it pays off. Uh, you can apply for grants. You can do like all kinds of things. I will say too, because of like the timing of when I quit or left my job. And then because I was making no money, I was able to get unemployment through the pandemic, which for real kept me afloat in 2020. It wasn't a lot of money, but it was enough for me to like eat, pay my rent. Um, and I just made it work. And I always kept in the back of my mind that if I needed to go back to work, it wasn't a big deal. Right. That I was just pushing myself as far as I could. And having that mindset of like going back to work is not a setback. It's building for the next step. And so it never, I don't know, it never really got me down. That's I, awesome. I felt yeah. focused on it. Yeah. How, how many hours a day do you put into art? Right. Now that you're, now that you're. <laughs> She said all of them. <laughs> no, but like, <laughs> re realistically, is it like 12 hours a day you're in your studio? Is it, is it eight hours a day or is it totally varying? Do you, do you separate like weekends to weekdays? Like how do you manage your time? Because it's all in your self-control at this point, right? Like nobody's forcing you to get up and go to work. You have to have that drive internally. 100%. Um, I work, I'm a workhorse. I'm like addicted to it. I'm probably in here 60, 70 hours a week. I work seven days a week, like no days off. That's also an issue. Like I am starting to learn to like take a day off, cut a day back, don't burn out. Um, and I will say like, very honestly, sometimes I come to my office and I don't do anything. I'll just like, my mind's not there. I'm just like looking at shoes on grailed you know like doing things i should not be doing or whatever watching tv but i still came to my office i showed up and i don't leave until i can at least cross one thing off my list if i was so tired that day that i only crossed one thing off i still did one thing yeah um, that's still, that's still a little win and I, I don't think enough people celebrate those right like just showing up for yourself is enough sometimes of like, right. Hey, I at least took the effort. I didn't sulk and I didn't stay in my house or my apartment or in bed. I actually got up. I was physically present mentally. Maybe I wasn't there, but I at least accomplished something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. hundred percent. The pandemic definitely had a few, maybe like a day or two a week where I was just like staring at the wall in my office. But, um, you know, so I want to, I want to deep dive a little bit into actually how we got to know each other through Clubhouse, right? And I think a lot of people were in the same boat where literally one year ago, right? It was like it was like late January, early February, March, where it was very dark out, cold, winter months. Everybody's trying to like produce work and being creative, but there's no like inspiration. Like the world is like in shock and has no idea which, what's going to happen in the future. And, you know, how, what was, 
today, like, I don't think you use Clubhouse as much, and nor do I, right? And, but like, what do you think was like the greatest takeaway for you in the time spent? Um, because I think everybody spent a lot of hours on that app. Um, oh, yeah. But like, what was your biggest takeaway? Like, who has like influenced your life the most? Because for me, it's a lot of people. Like, it really changed a lot of what I, what I do and the people that I know. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm super grateful that we are able to connect on there. Um, and it was just like by happenstance, like my, uh, in terms of like just a takeaway from there, I think it helped me to be a little bit more self-aware of like when I'm not okay. Cause like having connection to human beings again, I was like, oh man, like I miss people. Like I, I was so like kind of focused, like with blinders on of like, I need to work. I need to do all these things. And then Clubhouse gave me a second to like put my feet up. And then I was like, oh, wow, like I'm struggling. I need to like deal with this because I'm being sucked into this app for seven hours of a day. That means I like miss people. And so it did help me kind of realign some of my priorities there. Um, and also just help me connect with people in a really amazing way. I lo What I loved about it was that I felt like people could be so much more sincere than just like, typing things on Twitter or through text or wherever else. I loved hearing people's stories, like actually having this like human element of connection back again was so important. And, um, and also just like sometimes fun. There was like a room, there was a room called the dad joke roast. That was one of my favorites. And it was just a stage where you could come up and tell a dad joke and then everyone roasted you for how bad your joke was. And it was the best. <laughs> Um, and it lasted just a little while, but like even little things like that, I was like, this is awesome. Like I never would have found this. Um, the artist lounge that Thomas started, um, blew up so quick and it was so awesome to connect with people all over the world. Like, um, I've still kept in touch with a lot of those people and, and people I never would have met, honestly, like, like just cause, ever, like ever. Yeah, never. <laughs> cause if not, we, we just move so fast and. I don't know. It was, it was interesting because I got on Clubhouse like maybe like two months before it got really big, before the Art of the Sound, before all that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, because a developer that I've worked with messaged, emailed me and he was like, you need to get on this app. There's a lot of developers talking to people and I think you could find connections to get murals for the future. So I had been using it for business for like a month and a half to go in there and like sit on city meetings and be like, oh, well, I'm a muralist. And then it just turned into this big party. And I was like, OK. And then I got to learn about NFT super early. Um, so that, I think, was also my other biggest takeaway was like getting to learn about NFTs. I invested like or like late 2020 in crypto. like enough to like make a little bit of money off of it by now. Um, just cause people were talking about it and I was like, okay, cool. Let's put some money away. Same. So yeah. So I think, I think that was the best part of it. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And before we are going to talk, uh, or I, I want you to share kind of your story through your NFT uh, journey. Um, but before we do that, um, I want to talk about like, tangible things and specifically physical items i did notice that um and you also mentioned that you consider yourself a designer you also started a clothing company um which my understanding is it's called crybaby if i'm not mistaken no it's now it's called liminal reality so oh. i i made some shirts under this like other project called crybaby that was um for my illustrations and then I put them out and it just felt too personal and I wanted to take it back. And so I took a, I pumped the brakes and then, and I keep all those illustrations to myself. They're like, they're like my safe space to process things. And, um, I don't know, it felt ingenuine sharing something that was supposed to be for me. It felt like I was forcing myself to do it and I didn't like it. Um, but then last year with the nft clothing i started liminal reality um which will continue to expand this year oh okay I'm that's excited exciting. about it yeah so so do you think that the, did the clothing come first or did the nfts come first 
the NFTs came first and then um then I met Neil from Complex yep. Con. Um and because clothing is so integral to what they do, I was like, okay, maybe now I try to do clothes again um and introduce it back. Clothing, like as a kid, I wasn't really an artist as a kid. I started painting like five, six years ago. But um I would always draw clothing. I would like draw little characters wearing fun clothes. And it was like the the thing that always made me stay creative. And so I'm trying I'm trying to find the footing of how I want to do it because I don't want to force it. Like I want my experience with clothing and with design to be for my inner child, to be like the thing that I know I always wanted to do, but I never knew how and I didn't really ever I don't know. I I was like I come from a family that's very like be a businesswoman, get a big job. And so art was just like never in, on my mind, but I think when I think back on it, I think that like that part of myself wanted it so bad. Right. And yeah. Do you do you think uh that artists these days have to be kind of multifaceted of painting murals uh clothing you know nfts do you have to be multifaceted to be quote unquote successful or even just survive and like live like relatively or do you think that you can be successful only having one medium i think you can be successful doing one thing but it's a risk you know it's the same thing if you look in business like you can put all your money in one thing it might blow up you might get rich that's like a one in a million. But if you keep a diverse portfolio, you can hit more things. Same thing goes with art. Like if you're able to, if you're able to like create a brand that has like a character or a style or some sort sort of signature, and then you can apply it to different things, then you can reach like completely new audiences who maybe don't care about painting but they saw your mural on the street or they don't even care about murals, but they love clothing. And so they want to rock your clothes or, you know, they like posters or whatever else. Do you, so I love that because I, I feel the same way just on a personal front, but like, how do you split or separate those portions of creative in your mind? Because they each deserve a full time, you know, appreciation but you can't do that because you're trying to expand and do these different segments. So like, how do you specifically, how do you break up the time between painting between, you know, clothing or designer alley versus muralist alley versus how do you, how do you kind of separate all those different fields? Um, so again, super candid last year I was drowning. I had not figured it out yet. But this year, I have brought on two people into my team, um, okay. one to help me with my physical art and just like managing contracts, helping me strategize plans, and then one that's helping me with um, NFT, same thing, strategy. Um, because I am, I'm super type A and I love to plan and I love to organize. That's why my art is like very organized. Things are like in a place because I like things that way. But I also like get really wrapped up in it. And so I needed to bring in a couple people to help me like, to help be like, you don't need to think about this right now. You need to just make this right now. And so I think this year, that's my, actually my goal for my biggest goal for this year is to learn to focus on one project at a time and be like, and, and just to like have the longevity to be like, this project goes here because it actually feeds into this. And so like, you know, this mural introduces a new idea that then I put on clothing that then comes back into a painting, but not trying to do everything at the same time. I do not recommend that for anybody. That is amazing. That's not what I was expecting. So you're, you're growing an empire. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> do you have, do you, have you thought about that? Like, do you have like a vision or like, you know, out in three to five years, like that you want it to be like a 10 person company, like with, with your, you as a human being a brand, like, have you thought about that? A hundred percent. I look at artists like Greg Mike that have such a solid team behind it. Oh yeah. And I mean, he's a beast himself. Like, don't get me wrong. He's working probably five times more than I am, but, um, 
he has such an amazing team of support around him and he's able to accomplish so much because of it. And so I think last year my mentality was like trying to do what artists at that level are doing, but I'm one person. And so I burnt out completely. I lost it. So this year I was like, okay, we have to scale back. We start with two people. And then once the two people help me build to the next level, we bring in four people. And now my projects that I can take on grow even bigger. And so, yeah, I think that's like my goal is to eventually like within five years, I'd like to just be focused on art and strategy and like just having a vision and then be able to make enough to pay people. I'm, I, I don't ever feel the need to like be rich. I'd like to own a house one day, but you know, I'd rather reinvest everything I make right back into what I'm building so that 10, 15 years down the road, I can be in a position like some of these big artists that I admire so much. That's all. I'm super excited. I mean, that makes me stoked for you in the future and kind of what you're building uh, and that you're not just like putting all your eggs in one basket of like, because your, your mur murals just, just murals, right? Like they're badass and awesome you know but like how far can you take that and I think using Greg Mike and for those who have never heard Greg Mike's name you should definitely look out his work because he he is very expansive right like he's got a gallery he does prints he does physical art he does mural he, NFTs the whole nine yards right so I think that's a it's a kind of a great uh, example to kind of even uh, model after um, there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that so um, how important do you think are artists who are trying to figure it out um, and translating their work towards the NFT or digital space. Um, because you not only have launched NFTs for your work, but you're also getting into augmented reality and some other uh, really interesting things and collaborating with music and other, um, just like a vast variety of things, right? So how, how are you figuring out what's right for you? And then how important is it being or translating your physical or real, real art into the digital space? Totally. So at first, um, I just made NFTs kind of to experiment. It was yeah. like actually where I pushed color the first time. And I looked at NFTs as the place to do the thing I can't do in the physical world because I'm constrained by something like an element. And so I was like, this is where you take those ideas that you're like, oh man, but I can't because physics or whatever. And then um, because things kind of started shifting so quickly, I kind of took a step back and wanted to just kind of see how things were expanding and growing. Um, and then, um, but I will say one step back, I did do a physical painting with an NFT as like my second NFT. Um, and Blau owns it, the painting's in his house. That's awesome. Um, yeah, which is tight. Um, <laughs> Yeah, which is tight. Yeah, no, that's fucking cool. <laughs> yeah, it is cool sometimes. Like when he posts like videos in his house, I see it like on his bar. I'm like, I need that. Oh, that's but, awesome. Um, I I do more than just like NFTs as art. I really started to see pretty early on that the real benefit of NFTs was actually the utility side of it and the authentication. And so I pump the brakes to figure that stuff out and to really lean into like how to integrate augmented reality um, and how to integrate the metaverse and all those things. And so um, starting with this painting behind me, all the paintings have an NFC chip inside of them. It's like a little sticker. You can tap your phone on it and it'll actually take you to the NFT, which authenticates the piece. Oh, and so cool. um, I'll do that with my murals as well. And so um, I think that it works for different people in different ways. If you have a ton of digital art that you've never been able to do anything with, put it up as an NFT. It can live as digital art and that's 100% fine. And now there's a place for it. Um, for me that I'm really still tied to the physical, but I like this idea of decentralized um, authentic authentication. Um, I'm just gonna be like microchipping all my paintings pretty much. Um, and my murals and the clothing also wow. just to like keep things. And I think that's the way it's going to go. I, Louis Vuitton, I read, is going to be putting an FC chip in everything so that they can, you can actually like scan a bag to see if it's fake or not. Um, yeah, which is pretty interesting. How, 
are they expensive? Like, is it, is there a cost yeah. up front for, oh, okay. Like, but I'm There's saying, a cost. Yeah. So you, you, like, you, have to, you have to pay for, I don't know, is it, is it kind of like uh, ordering a bunch of stickers and then just like <laughs> sticking them? Okay. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. They, sometimes they're stickers, sometimes they're not, and you can like glue them. They're like 30 cents each. Oh. They're not expensive. Oh, okay. That's int- I learned something new today. So I'm stoked yeah. about that. <laughs> I might, I might have to start doing that. <laughs> yeah, you should. Everyone should do it. It's like, just for the, like your future collectors to be able to like authenticate things. Like you are doing a service. I, I feel we are doing a service to our collectors by like, instead of giving them just a certificate of authenticity that you can lose, right. making sure that we guarantee that it's authentic, that it has a position in your history as an artist, um, which, you know, for anyone who has the vision to build something long-term, you want to create something for the people who buy in early, where 20 years down the road, when you hopefully are big, they can sell it if they need to, or they can hold on to it, pass it down to generations and be like, this is authentic. I can prove it. It's on the blockchain. Right. Um, and it's worth so much more now. That's amazing. I, uh, I'm going to tap into that brain of yours to try to understand this a little bit more uh, after this is over. Um, but I'm going to stay focused here. Is there anything, obviously 2022 just started, uh, we're eight days, nine days into the year. Um, do you have a plan? You mentioned years ago when you were kind of just getting going out on your own, like you built out a six month plan and like you started kind of just chipping away at it and understanding and and really your type A kind of planning mode came out. Have you done that for this year? Or do you do that every year? Or is that, are you at a point now where you can kind of relax a little bit and focus on the creative and not worry so much about that? So I, I like set goals for the year. Um, and then I am trying to like strategize with these two people that I brought onto my team, like the best approach for it. I, I, I leave an, I've left enough space this year to kind of let things happen. Last year, I tried, things kind of came to me with time, and then I just didn't have the time for it, and I think I fumbled them a little bit, um, which I think it's also important to recognize. Like, I, I think, even though I love everything I made last year, I feel like I only could give 90% of myself because I was so tired. I was just like brain dead and doing everything alone. So this year, my goal is to like push everything at 110%. Everything's more than perfect. It's better than I wanted it to be. Um, and so I'm taking things kind of like two months at a time. Okay. Having things like set for, you know, throughout the year. Um, but I, I am working on like a few big projects instead of like a hundred small ones, a couple big projects that, um, are both within my art and then a little bit outside of myself, but just like some community building things that um, I think are important to help the city of Denver kind of push its art scene forward. I I love that. I've really learned over the past few years that like being in service of others is like the greatest thing every human should do. And like when you just give all the time, guess what? Like good things happen to you as well and it just like Mm -hmm. seems like this math equation that like people don't believe in but like then we learned it as a kid and yet like we become grown-ups and then you know people aren't always good people and then you you know but once you start helping other people all the time like good things just naturally happen it's kind of like a wild sphere and then if you know you as a creator now who has six seven eight years of backlog knowledge and mistakes like you can go and educate other people I think that's super valuable yeah a hundred percent. And, and I did spend a lot of time last year. Um, I'm like a kind of a guarded person, I think, or I know. And, um, <laughs> I, I think that, um, I spent a long time kind of, I, I started in the music industry and there's just like so much smoke and mirrors in that industry. And I got super disillusioned in like, you know, finding people that were honest and authentic. Cause you know, that's, where I can like actually be myself and I can actually collaborate really well with people when I feel like they're authentic. And last year I was struggling with it. And then it kind of just hit me. Like if I just build something the way that I imagine a better world to be, then those people will just come to it. Like I won't have to filter through people. 
they will just come to the thing that I make. And so that's why I'm putting a lot of effort into this thing this year is to con find those people and then allow them to connect and kind of build this network of people that like you do in so many ways that are just authentic, that are building together where, you know, we aren't just consuming from one another. We're actually contributing to one another. And, and I think that's so essential. So I'm excited for that kind of pivot and to just like, I don't know. I get, I'm like, I stay inside a lot. So I'm excited to like connect with people again and like be a human. I don't know. <laughs> no, it's, it's the truth. That's fantastic. Um, I have two final questions for you. Uh, the first is where can people find you? Where can they follow your journey as you progress into this year? And it sounds like you have a lot of big projects and big things coming um, social, or do you have a website that people could check out um, kind of where can people follow you? Totally. Um, on Instagram, a l grime a dot l dot underscore grime. Um, on Twitter, a l grime art. My website, a l grime art dot com. Um, or if you want to look at the clothing, um, liminal reality dot net. And then um, starting probably in the next two weeks, I'm also going to be in crypto voxels in the metaverse. Um, I just bought a gallery that's under construction right now. Um, and so you'll be able to see all of my murals in the real world will get plastered onto the walls of that building as they happen this year and moving forward. So if you want to see a mural, but you don't live in that city, you can always pop into the metaverse and check it out there. Okay. That's wild. I got to start asking people like if they have, like, do you have like an open C page or something like for your digital art? Um, I have some on open C, just AL Grime. I have some on Maker's Place. Okay. Um, same thing. And then I have two on foundation, but, um, I, I think I'm going to start minting myself using those manifold contracts, um, where they're like, you can make your own smart contract. Cause then it's like assigned to you directly. And yeah. I like that part of the authentication. That's awesome. Um, so a lot cooking, a lot to just ale grime everywhere people. Uh, yes. that's the key takeaway. <laughs> Um, and the last question that I have for you, and I, I try to ask or remember to ask as many guests as possible, but like if you had one piece of advice for anybody, uh, a creator, a creative, or somebody getting started, or somebody who's looking to pivot their career, anything, any sort of piece of advice that you would give even to your younger self, uh, what's the first thing that comes to mind or what would you share with people? Um, I would say you need to you need to work on yourself a little first you for it to succeed in a business where you make your own hours, you are your own boss, you take care of your own books. You have to actually be in a place mentally where you can actually be both empathetic with yourself and honest with yourself at the same time. You have to be able to like be mentally focused enough to say like, this actually, I'm not good at this. This actually isn't serving me so that you can pivot. And then you have to be able to empathize with yourself enough to be like, it's okay that I'm not good at this. I can find someone that can help me with this. And if you have those two ingredients, like, and the drive to just like be willing to show up, then you can succeed at anything, you know, like then you'll, that determination comes afterwards, that hunger will feed it. And you'll never burn out if you're able to be honest with yourself and you're able to also just be like, it's okay, that didn't go well. We're going to do it again and you're going to do it better. So yeah, those two things, like be kind to yourself, but keep it real with yourself and everyone around you. I love that. Um, Allie, this has been awesome. Thank you for joining us on An Untold Narrative. This is episode 54. Uh, I'm stoked to watch the rest of this year kind of unfold. And uh, thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.